Thank you all for being here, um, and thank you to the Humanities Center for their generous funding and support of this project. Scrittore traditore. My, it's a false Italian accent. I, I don't speak. That's the Italian that I speak. Examining style and influence in the translations of the Mexican author Fabio Moravito. So that's a mouthful of deception, I'm going to say. And I'm about to betray you all a bit more during this talk. Uh, so please be patient. And you might be asking, you know, what's this translator doing? Uh, not even translating the title. But that's really what I want to talk about in this, uh, in this talk. And um, to give an idea of, to consider how translation works, considering work, uh, words, language, the, the language behind words, and to think of what influences me as I work as a translator and how I'm influencing you as readers uh, without you possibly realizing that. Before I get started uh, or into that, I'm going to work a little bit backwards and talk about this guy, Fabio Moravito. Fabio lives in Mexico City, where he teaches in the Autonomous uh, University of Mexico. He translates from Italian, the translator of the complete works of Eugenio Montale and Aminta by Tasso Torquato, and he's the author of four books of poetry, five books of short stories, two novels, and three books of essays, including El Idioma Materno, uh, the book I've translated as Mother Tongue, partially with assistance from the Humanities Center, and I'll talk about that. Uh, a little bit later as well. The book is made up of 84 brief texts of exactly 2,000 characters each, um, or 2,000 char characters in length. Um, they appeared in a newspaper column in the newspaper Clarín in Buenos Aires. What's extraordinary about this guy uh, in terms of his work as a translator and writer is that he was born in Alexandria, Egypt uh, to Italian parents. He moved to Italy when he was five with his parents and lived there until he was 15 when he moved again uh, to Mexico, where he's, he's lived ever since. So um, inside this biographical information is a unique linguistic occurrence, one that harkens back to the beginning of the title, Scrittore Traditore. Here we have a man whose native language is Italian but speaks, writes, and lives his day-to-day -day life in Spanish, his acquired language. This act of living outside apart from one's mother tongue is one of betrayal, according to Moravito, much like writing in general. The most foreign foreigner of them all is one who writes in another language by virtue of that double foreignness, that of writing which is an usurpation of one's voice and that of writing in a language that is not native, which is a betrayal of speech. Every writer becomes a writer thanks to this betrayal. He moves away from his mother tongue to adopt a language that isn't his own, a foreign language, a language without emotion. And I think this is really interesting in thinking that he's not only talking about translation, but also writing in general, right? Uh, just the act of writing is one of betrayal. Um, so uh, uh, to, consider, to consider this betrayal or traditore, um, how that's floated around for centuries, hovering around the translation act, attempting to drown those who perform it. Um, there's the Italian adage, traduttore, traditore. A literal translation is translator, traitor, which is said to come from the Italians who felt that many French language translations of Dante uh, betrayed either the beauty of the accuracy of the work or resulting in the clever consonants playing upon the worst fears of an international society. And then there's a Tuscan proverb that uses traduttori, traditori, in which the plural form, right, with the I uh, there, um, expresses the same resentment as if only the conclusion to be drawn from the long collective experience of translators, um, those who hold the knowledge hidden in an unknown language is that they can't be trusted. All right, so what does Fabio have to say about this? Morabito tells his students, um, and this is, this is important to note that, yes, he's an educator. He, he, he's not only a writer, not only teaching literature, but he also teaches translation theory. So he's encouraging um, people uh, this idea that to learn to translate, one must learn to cheat or to betray. Um, you know, I think that, obviously, 
as a teacher to go into a classroom and say, I'm going to teach you how to cheat. I'm going to teach you how to break some rules. Uh, this, is, this is really important. Even though he talks about this idea of suggesting. Whoever doesn't cheat doesn't suggest. And when you translate, you suggest. Even though suggesting is a broad concept, it would be wrong to believe that this is only applied to washing machine instructions. Even when we translate Homer or Shakespeare, we want above anything else to suggest. The translator who forgets this isn't a translator, but a talented copyist, or if you want, a bootlicker. Um, it's important to note that this advice is quite, you know, as I said, uh, contrary to the common belief of what a translator does. But I also want to draw attention to this word, bootlicker. You might be thinking, well, you know, Curtis has translated this and possibly not chosen the right word here. But this is also an indication of the shifts in diction uh, that Morabito often has in these texts. Uh, by the way, all of these texts, all of these quotes are, are uh, texts that I've translated from uh, what he's done. So I want to get to this idea of betrayal. What does it have to do with style and influence? Before I started the project, I had an idea that, um, uh, an idea which was that the style of a translated author is in fact the style or uh, the work of his translator, and I still think that that's the case. Um, I thought that as a translator I should attempt to convey an author's voice, and this certainly influenced how I approached Moravito's prose. However, the more I read about Moravito's own writing and his thoughts on translation, I realized I was possibly being too careful and too thoughtful. Um, so I think that I needed to consider time and space and think about uh, kind of different kinds of influence. Moravito offered a lesson to his in, in this reconsideration through his translation of Tasso Torquato, the 16th century Italian poet. Um, Torquato wrote Aminta, which was first translated into Spanish by Juan de Jaregui in 1604. And believe it or not, that translation has been more or less the primary uh, translation of significance of the 16th century Italian poet until Moravito retranslated it in 2001. In this retranslation, or this new translation, Moravito has been criticized for allowing a few details to slide, details that created some confusion for the reader. Um, and those errors in his translation, according to those who have criticized him or written about that, are a result of his use of expressions, or contemporary expressions, right? That, uh, and on this, you can see, you know, he's got a number of things to say, but. Primarily, I think that when we translate, there's no way to escape the calamity of the present. So I, I really want to focus on that, or I, I have a lot of, I think a lot about that idea of the calamity of the present of a particular time, but then down there toward the bottom, since we're always betraying an original because we're bringing it up to date, I think the translator should come to grips with this betrayal and carry it out in a consistent manner right, from a stylistic perspective. It's as if he's giving his translator some permission here to change, right, to make changes to a text, and, um, but saying also that if you don't do this, you're going to have some problems, that you're translating incorrectly. Um, as I mentioned previously, uh, uh, Moravito has translated the complete works of Montale, the contemporary Italian poet, and in his writing on this project, Moravito provides uh, insight into considerations of meaning, not over explaining ambiguities. Uh, so translation is a form of approximation, but also separation from the author. I feel a more moral familiarity with Montale. I turn down the volume. Translating him submerged me in the intimate weaves of a truth. One of the gifts of a translator, uh, one of the gifts a translator receives is building upon his expressive abilities in places that perhaps he hadn't thought uh, about previously. You see here that through his translation, he's discovered a number of things about the writer, but also about his own writing. Um, and I think that an important idea here is that uh, we have to welcome the style of the writer we're translating and welcome that influence on our own works as a writer, right? So getting back to that initial uh, escritore, traditore, uh, uh, traidore, excuse me, uh, the writer, traitor uh, is, is significant. So for Marabito, translation is a shortcut because it involves selecting on the path to comprehension the shortest and least compromising route. 
The translator leaves the truth intact. He doesn't absorb or transform it, but only emphasizes it. The translator has to be careful not to understand more than what the words say, to not go too deeply into them and hold them back. He has to grant them relative weight, lacking, looking askance at them and not head on. Like the poet, the translator perceives before the meaning of the phrase its mental curve. The translator isn't, uh, the, vir the greatest virtue of the translator isn't precision, but rhythm. Perhaps that first line may be the most significant for me. Do not understand more than what the words say. As a poet, I'm always thinking about what words say and thinking about the ripple that goes beyond them. But as a translator, I have to think, what is that word and perhaps not going beyond necessarily what, what uh, that author uh, considers. I think the writers we, we read are, are teachers and we appropriate their influence. This perhaps goes in contrary to Bloom's central thesis in his anxiety of influence that we're hindered in our creative process by the relationship we maintained with precursor writers. It seems necessary that the translator internalize, absorb those writers who the writer also absorbed. In Morabito's case, he, uh, he realizes that uh, the influence of, of Montale, for example, is T.S. Eliot, he also translated Shakespeare and Homer. Um, he was influenced by Dante and Giovanni Pascoli. Uh, but then Morabito's influences, thinking of other Italians, Umberto Saba, Ungaretti, Montale himself, and then Mexican writers, American writers, French, German, Czech, and on and on. Um, knowing all of this, thinking about all of those influences doesn't necessarily make me Morabito's perfect translator. I'm not saying that, but it uh, certainly makes me one, uh, a better one than I was before. So um, you might be thinking, well, what have I done? You know, what, what's the process here? What have I accomplished? Um, I'd like to consider all of this in the text I'm going to read in closing. Um, one of the first texts from the book Mother Tongue, as I've translated El Idioma Materno. Um, and again, I've translated this whole book and now this talk is going to, is uh, the beginning of an introductory element of, uh, of for this book in translation. Um, so the text that I'm going to read is Scritore Traditore. Um, I left it in, I left it in, uh, it's, you can see it's in Italian, right? I've left it in Italian. The Spanish text also has the, the title in Italian. Not, I didn't leave it that way because I thought the reader would necessarily know right away what it means, but I wanted you to consider the fact that you have this author writing in, a, writing in Spanish of Italian descent, He's also playing. It's important for you to understand that play as well. So with that in mind, I'm going to read you this text in English. You can see the Spanish translation here, or the Spanish original, and um, we can talk about that afterwards if you want. Scritore traditore. I fell in love with a boy when I was seven years old. I could have fallen in love with a girl, but in my school, the boys and girls were separated. So I fell in love with the only girl within reach. She was Massimo P, an extremely timid and sensitive boy who kept to himself. It was the first day of school. We were at recess, and Massimo came up to me and asked if I could tie his shoes. He looked helpless, surrounded by so many shouting boys running helter-skelter around the playground, and I was smitten by his delicate beauty. You look like a girl, I told him, and he, perhaps accustomed to hearing such a thing, merely smiled. Recess ended and when we went back to the classroom, his seat was two rows from mine, but not once did he turn around to look at me. And I thought he'd forgotten. Then it was time for recitation. Each of us opened our books and prepared to read a section of the story out loud. A few boys read before the teacher pointed at Massimo. His finger pressed down at the start of the paragraph. He uttered the first word, rather, he stuttered it. He stumbled over the second word too, and again over the next one. He read so badly that he couldn't finish the sentence. The teacher lost his patience and told another student to continue reading. I accepted the sad truth. Massimo P, despite his angelic appearance, was a complete nitwit. Then it was my turn. I made a sudden decision. I would read worse than Massimo. 
If I had followed through with it, I think today I would be a better man than I am. If there are decisive events in our childhood, this was one of them. After intentionally making mistakes throughout the first line, I realized I couldn't cripple one more word, and I began to read with such fluency that the teacher praised me with a nod of admiration. This is good reading, he said. And I think it was then that I had an inkling that I could have a vocation writing books. At almost the same moment, I first tasted betrayal. I've always thought that these two vocations are inextricably linked. Thank you.